Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everyone to the first session of the tech track at the DHS2 annual conference in 2020, uh, digital online this year, obviously. Um, hope you are uh, enjoying the other sessions. I think there's been some really great ones and uh, maybe some of you saw the innovation session at the COVID-19 uh, day yesterday, um, which featured a number of custom applications that people had built on top of DHIS2. Um, and that's generally what we're going to be talking about over the next two days in the tech track. There are a few other uh, technical sessions as well that aren't directly related to that. Um, but that isn't specifically web applications either. We're also going to talk about uh, Android applications, as well as the feedback loop between local innovation and uh, the global platform that is DHIS2. So I'm going to start off our session here today. It looks like we have a number of people coming in. Uh, first, I'm going to talk a little bit about DHIS2 as a platform in general, and then I'll talk about specifically how we enable web applications in what we call the web app platform. Uh, so there's a little bit of a, an overlap in naming there, but uh, I'll talk a little bit about it generally and then specifically what we're doing for the, the web application uh, enablement. Uh, then I'll turn it over to my colleague Jose, who will introduce the Android SDK. Uh, which is the equivalent of the web app platform for mobile, mobile uh, applications, specifically on Android. Uh, and then I will turn it over to another colleague, uh, Magnus from the University of Oslo, who will talk about the design lab that he leads there, um, which is specifically working with uh, implementation, implementers in the field to feedback uh, innovation from the field, to the innovation enablement that we uh, work on here at the, the DHS2 core team. Um, finally, I'll, I'll wrap it up by talking a little bit about our, our work with developer advocacy and the, the feedback loop that Magnus will introduce. Um, and then we'll move on to uh, a couple other sessions. So immediately following this session will be a more in-depth dive that I will lead on the web application platform. Um, We'll have similar one uh, sessions, one hour each uh, tomorrow at both one o'clock for Android SDK. And I believe, oh, sorry, it's two o'clock for Android SDK and three o'clock for the design lab. I'll have the, the, the times at the end, um, but those will be tomorrow. So you, if you want to learn more about those, uh, you can follow up with Jose or Magnus tomorrow as well. Uh, if you have any questions, please go to the uh, community of practice um, there's a specific topic under the annual com conference category for questions to, regarding this uh, session, and we'll uh, try to address some of those at the end if we have some time, otherwise we'll address them asynchronously. So first to talk a little bit about some of the uh, developer training and outreach that we've done this uh, summer. Um, I should have mentioned also that uh, back in December, there was a, uh, an in-person Android SDK um, workshop uh, or academy uh, that took place in Sri Lanka. And uh, this summer we were able to, we had to go online, unfortunately, but we were able to still host a, a, a good amount of training for developers building on top of DHIS2. Um, we'll talk a little bit about some of the, the additional um, training and, and resources that we're, that we're developing, um, but we had a, a pretty uh, successful training summer here in uh, University of Oslo uh, with these online trainings. We had two open webinars in June with more than 120 participants each. Uh, followed by a workshop at the end of June, and then a, a four-day workshop, which were uh, together made up the, a developer academy uh, in August, and those had about 30 participants each. So that, we thought that was very successful. Um, look for any feedback from the participants uh, and got some very good feedback from, from the people who were there and look forward to doing more of that. We also have a, a central repository for resources for developers, specifically building extensions to DHIS2. Um, this is mostly focused on web application extensions, but it also links to some of the Android resources and we're looking to expand the, the resources that, uh, that we have about the Android uh, SDK there as well. Um, this is developers.dhis2.org, so that should always be the place to go for any resources that you want to learn about uh, how to build uh, applications on top of the DHIS2 platform. Wanted to make a, a mention of that. So 
what is the platform that we're talking about here? And the platform is DHIS2. That's not always obvious, but DHIS2 is not, is not a, a kind of out of the box software. It's a platform that you can build on top of to customize to fit the needs of your particular use case, your particular locality, uh, and, and lots of other things. So it's, it's, a, it's kind of a, a, a toolkit that lets you build what you want on top of it or what you need for your, for your use case. This is a, a diagram that was developed by Scott Ruspatrick, my colleague who's the, the analytics product manager. Uh, and he uses this, uh, it came from an earlier publication as well in, in some research by the University of Oslo. Um, but there's a number of, of different layers that make up DHIS2. So you have the DHIS2 core at the center, which has the API and the data model, the metadata. Uh, around that, you have some bundle applications that we develop here at the University of Oslo. Around that, you have some additional applications that are developed by third parties. Maybe they're developed uh, and shared through the app hub that we make available, or they are developed and just installed locally to a particular instance. Um, and then finally, you have some interoper interoperability with different software um, on the periphery. I'm um, not going to get into too much about this, this here today, but I wanted to start with this as kind of a framing. The, the piece we're going to focus on is the bundled applications and the periphery applications. So this works both for web apps and for uh, Android applications. But basically, we have some applications that we develop as the, U the DHS2 core team that are built into DHS2. And then there are a lot of applications that are built by other people um, or by DHS2 or DHS2 with or, or UIO with some uh, collaborators uh, that are not bundled with the, the war file that you install when you, when you uh, start to work on DHS2. But this sort of concentric circles diagram doesn't fully cover what we're, what we're actually doing here. Uh, so I wanted to, to take a step back and, and sort of change that up. Because what we're actually doing is more like this. So we have DHIS2, which is the, uh, again, the APIs, the metadata model, all of that. And then we have a layer, which is the platform layer. So that actually enables web applications to uh, run on DHIS2. It provides a lot of things out of the box that uh, are just provided by, uh, by that platform that make it robust and secure and performant and modern uh, applications to, uh, enables those to run on the DHS2 platform. Uh, but the important thing here is that we don't have bundled web apps on the inside and then installed uh, external web apps on the outside. They're the same thing. So we're, we're actually using the same tools that we're building and making available for these installed web applications for our building our own uh, uh, core applications that are provided out of the box in DHS2. And it's exactly the same for Android as well. So uh, you just replace uh, the, the web app platform with the Android SDK. You have the DHS2 Android application. Uh, and then you also have custom Android applications that are uh, on, on the same level as the, the, the official DHS2 Android app uh, and can use a lot of the same functionality that's built into the SDK that enables uh, those robust, modern, and powerful uh, features of uh, building on top of DHS2. So if we were to rethink that concentric circle diagram a little bit, we would think about it this way. We have DHIS2 at the center, then we have the Android SDK, the application platform, and around the outside on an equal playing field, you have the, the core applications and the Android application that are provided by DHIS2 and UIO. And then you also have custom web applications and custom Android applications that are on a, the, an equal playing field with those applications. This is, the, this is where we want to go. So historically, uh, the core applications have been kind of a privileged group, and then we have uh, created a separate uh, platform for uh, applications to uh, be installed uh, in addition as kind of uh, periphery or e external type services. Um, but we're moving towards a world where everything is the same and everything that you can do, we, uh, everything that we can do, you can do better. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute as well. Uh, to kind of a, uh, hammer this home in 235, which will be released in a couple weeks, uh, we have introduced a very, very cool new feature called continuous application integration or continuous app delivery. Um, and what that means is that your bundled applications that come in your war file, like the app management app or the dashboards app or the maintenance app, 
can all be updated from the App Hub. So if you go to your app management application uh, right now uh, in 235 and the version on that we've published as UIO to the, the App Hub, apps.dhs2.org, is a higher version than the one that is bundled in 235, you'll see this dialog here, which allows you to update and, and reload your application. So that's actually checking with apps.dhs2.org to see if there's a new version available. And then you can update just this one application in, uh, in your particular DHS2 instance. So once you've done that, you'll see that it, it's installed. You have an app management app that looks just like an installed app that you would uh, build and, and deploy yourself. But this is built by UIO, it's deployed through the App Hub, and it's actually overriding the one that you have uh, installed, bundled with your WAR file when you install DHS2 out of the box. So this means that we can move much quicker to fix bugs and introduce new features. We can also start to produce applications that work for multiple versions of DHIS2. Uh, and implementers can start to pick and choose the applications that they want to update, the, the pieces that they, they're ready to implement in their system, uh, and they can install just those without waiting for six months for the next release or waiting two years for until they have the, the, the funds and the, um, the technical uh, availability to upgrade their entire database and do a, do a migration that way. So this way, applications can be installed independently of uh, third or of uh, the the core, the DHS2 uh, server. It's important to note that this, is, this process is exactly the same as when you build and install a third party application from the App Hub. So here we have the App Management app, which is a core app bundled app that's overridden by uh, an app installed from the App Hub. And we also have a custom application that's also installed in this instance from the App Hub. Uh, so they're, again, on an equal playing field and can do a lot of the same things. Um, this is coming out, as I mentioned, in 235. Uh, and we think it's gonna enable a lot of really cool um, uh, innovation on, on the core team, as well as in the, in the platform as a whole. So I'll talk about the platform now quickly. Um, before I turn it over to my colleague Jose. Uh, again, there'll be a session after this that'll be one hour that will dive into more detail about what the web application platform does and how you can use it to build applications and how we use it at DHS2 to build applications as well. Um, but first, let's talk about what, what are the goals of that web application platform. The goal is to make it cheap, easy, and fast to build custom web applications which customize DHS2. So, Again, we have a number of applications like maintenance app, dashboards app, data visualizer, maps, uh, tracker, uh, tracker capture, capture application, all of these applications that are built into DHIS2 and have, are very powerful, but are uh, generic. So they're, they're not custom tailored for a specific use case. Uh, and that's by design. We, we're not able to customize those generic applications in a thousand different ways for all the different use cases that are out there. Uh, we try to make them as applicable to all of those applications as, uh, uh, or those use cases as possible. Um, but we're, we're never going to be, it's never going to be perfect for every single use case. So in some cases, you're going to want to build custom applications to enable custom workflows or to extend the capabilities of DHIS2 in some way. Uh, and the goal is to make it as cheap, easy, and fast to build those customizations as possible. That's both for us as the University of Oslo and DHS2, uh, who also use that same platform, that same system to, uh, to make ma maintenance of all of the applications that we, we uh, maintain uh, much easier and much, uh, much more cost effective as well, um, much less uh, um, uh, takes a lot of less effort from our developers to maintain applications on the platform than it did previously. Um, and that's what we're enabling, not only for our own applications, but for third party applications as well. Um, one way to, to I want to kind of uh, say that, or one way you could say that is that everything we can do as the University of Oslo, you can do better. So we want everything that a core application at some point, everything that a core application can do should be accessible by in a custom application in an easy and maintainable way. Um, and that'll allow, really allow us to build the building blocks for customization and uh, really tailored use cases for um, those applications in local contexts. 
I'll get into more about this in the next session, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but there's a lot that goes on in a DHS2 application occasion when you build uh, one from scratch. Um, so there's a lot of pieces that you have to kind of put together to make that possible. Um, and it gets even more complicated when you have to maintain a lot of those applications. So for instance, the University of Oslo has 34 core applications that we maintain um, that are bundled into your DHS2 instance or installable from the App Hub. Uh, we also have a number of libraries that are uh, used by those different applications that make it a little easier to kind of uh, reuse components within those applications, but we still have to build and maintain 34 different apps and, and that takes a lot of time and it's a lot of code. And it gets even more crazy when you think about the number of versions of DHIS2 that we support. So before we had continuous application delivery, uh, we have three versions, supported versions of DHIS2 that are released and out, uh, and out and being used by people in the wild. And we also have one version that we're developing that's the next version that's coming out. So that's four versions of every single one of these code bases that we have to maintain and uh, develop on. Uh, it's more than 160 or roughly 160 maintained code bases, which is pretty, pretty huge and, and for a relatively small team. So there's a lot, of, again, a lot of pieces in each one of those applications. When you multiply that by 160, it's pretty huge. So what, what the goal of the web uh, app platform has been, and I introduced it uh, a year ago at the, uh, um, the conference in, uh, in Oslo, the annual conference for DHIS2. Um, but it is, uh, yeah, and it's, co it's come a long way since then. So at that point, it had not uh, been fully developed. The version one was released in August of 2019. Um, and the goal is, has been to simplify all of our applications so that we can maintain them more easily and make it possible for uh, external developers to maintain their applications in the same way, develop and maintain. How do we do that? We split up our application into the pieces that are common to all apps on DHIS2 and the pieces that are uh, specific to what that app does. So this section in the middle is a much smaller piece of uh, code that is specific to this application and all the rest is, is common and can come from the platform. So this is the app shell or the platform that provides all of those common things. And then you can swap out the, the smaller piece that is the application whenever you need to uh, switch applications. So what does this actually look like? For our core applications, we have 30 something uh, apps that are uh, kind of hot swapped into this app, app shell. Uh, this is in the, go, coming down the line in the future. Right now we have about 10 applications that are on this platform uh, and we're hoping to make that the full, nearly the full list by 236, which comes out in uh, beginning of 2021. Um, so there's all of these applications, but they're, each one is much smaller and all of the common pieces are extracted uh, into a, a common runtime or a common shell. Uh, it becomes even more convincing when you have third-party applications as well that swap into that slot uh, in the same way as core applications. So they can take advantage of all of those services that the, the platform provides. We also, uh, it, through this platform, we provide a common or, or a standardized uh, application lifecycle, which allows you to develop and build your application in a, in a consistent way locally on your developer machine and then publish it to the App Hub uh, very easily so that it can be consumed and installed into DHS2 instances. Um, so we've, we've standardized that workflow and provided tools that allow make it much easier to uh, adopt that workflow for your applications. Um, and this gets even uh, more complicated but more interesting when we talk about testing and working with multiple versions of D the DHS2 uh, instance uh, to do that testing, as well as to deploy directly your application to instances to do manual testing uh, before publishing to the App Hub. I'll talk more about that in the next session. So with that, um, that was a quick introduction to the DHS2 web application platform. I'll turn it over to H Jose, my colleague from the Android team, who will talk about the Android SDK and how that enables uh, the Android team to build their Android app, as well as the uh, third-party developers to build custom Android applications. Jose, are you there? Yes. Hi, Austin. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me and see me? I can, yes. 
Okay, so now I need to share my screen then. Uh, screen. I think that someone needs to allow me to share my screen. How's this able participant screen? Sure, I will share. Um, I will just share. Oh. Simona, are you able to um, add Jose here? You should be able to share your screen, Jose, now. Okay, perfect, yes. <clears throat> okay, let me see. Okay, uh, can, all, can everyone see my screen now? I can see it, yeah. Okay, so Austin, if you please come pick me when I only have five minutes left. Sure. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, I'm going to introduce the, the, the DHS2 and VSDK. And as Austin was mentioning, tomorrow there's going to be a session, a full session of one hour uh, going to the a full description of the functionality. <clears throat> but today I have uh, we have 15 minutes for a uh, for an introduction. Um, but I'm trying to convince you uh, for the Android developers why you should use the, the SDK if you plan to, uh, to to develop a custom Android application. And first, some basic definitions. And I'm trying to um, move. Okay. Okay. So um, a definition, what the, the Android SDK is, is a common good, okay, uh, that allows uh, work offline. It has an internal database, so um, where we store all the metadata and data uh, that is needed in order for the application to function. Uh, communicate with different DSS2 instances through the API, and then facilitate the development of, of Android apps. Okay, this uh, we would say that these are the, the main three goals of the of the Android SDK. Um, as, as Austin was mentioning, uh, the access to is a platform that contains an API, which is a common good. Um, also, the, the Android application itself is not uh, reaching directly the API, but is using the, 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 our uh, mobile platform, that in this case is the DHS2 Android SDK. Okay, so all the communication between the mobiles, the Android mobiles, and uh, the, the UIO Android mobile application and the DHS2 API, is going through the DHS2 Android SDK. And of course, it's also published, so uh, there are uh, developers, Android developers out there, they can build their, their own like uh, Android applications up to, on top of the of the DHS2 Android SDK as well. The same as uh, Austin was mentioning with the app platform. Um, so this is more or less the, the, the these are the, this chart represents the, the SDK re releases that we have so far. So it is pretty new. I uh, would say the, the first release was in uh, the one zero in December 2019. And then since then we have other release in uh, at the end of April, other in, in August, and then we are going to publish the last one in uh, early October. Well, we have, sorry, we have in between like, of course, different patch versions as well, of course. Uh, and then we are going to publish the, the last one in, uh, in one three in, in early October. And then the, also in early October, we are going to publish as well the two, three Android application. Uh, but this is the case who makes possible to be compatible with the 235 uh, DHS2 version that is also is coming up in, in, in early October. Okay. So we see that the, in this chart that the, that the SDK and the, and the Android application is, uh, are aligned, uh, but this doesn't mean that this to be always the case. Uh, obviously, they're going to be aligned, but the, we, there are different products, so we may have like a different releases when there is no, uh, for example, an Android, applica uh, an Android application release. Okay. Um, but certainly you, you can expand to uh, a new, the newest uh, Android SDK version coming up in, in early October. Uh, you have here the, the, the link to the code that is available on GitHub and, and as well as the Jira. Okay. And what the SDK does, well, since the very beginning, since the version 1.0, so uh, uh, it's the metadata scene, right? So it replicates all the necessary parts of the access to data model uh, and store that in the in the in the in the access to uh, sorry in the Android local database. This means like we have that uh, tables in the in our local database that represents uh, uh, the aggregated domain, represents the events domain, and represents the tracker domain. So all the domains are, are embedded in the in the in the Android SDK. As well, the data sync, uh, we synchronize the data uh, as well. So it's in charge of the data synchronization with different parameters. So we can like uh, specify like the number of TIs or events to be uh, 
uh, synchronize with the with, with the we are with a VHS2 instance, but also we can play with the, with some parameters like we can specify the number of TIs or the number of units. Sorry, the number of TIs and events per unit, the number of TIs or events per program, or a combination of both. Okay. Uh, whenever we are like uh, doing the synchronization, we are always done synchronizing the ones that are in the in the data capture unit tree of the user. We are prioritizing the the TIs in terms of TIs, the TIs which enrollment status is open, and also those TIs that has been a, a last updated recently. Okay, um, and then since what we are going to see this in the in the ne in one of the next slides, now we have uh, more possibilities regarding defining more and more options here for granular data sync. Okay, but we are going to see that in in five minutes. Uh, of course, if we have a, a, a local database that uh, I think that currently uh, right now it contains like uh, 100 or 110 tables, so it's quite a lot. Uh, we don't want for the, of course, for the Android SDK users to 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 know perfectly know all the name of all the tables, and also to to run like a very complicated SQL sentences, right? So also since one zero, we have a date, what we call the data access layer that is kind of similar to Hibernate that basically allows you to using like a DHS2 uh, naming conventions to uh, to retrieve information that is coming or from the local database or from the API. Okay, this is this was a huge effort from the, the uh, made by the Android SDK developers, and we are going to explore miss more of this functionality tomorrow. Okay. Uh, for example, also uh, uh, since the very beginning, we have uh, what we call also the an expression evaluation engine. So um, that is, I think, quite nice uh, because here uh, we can make all the calculations of inline program indicators. Okay. We don't have indicators yet. We have program indicators in the context of ATI. Uh, this has been like a, uh, this is an ongoing uh, a work that is on progress. So we started in the in the version one zero, but then through one one and through the version one two, we have now like a, basically have mapped into Android SDK like the, I would say that the ninety eight percent of the variables of the expressions and all the formulas that are presented in in the server side. So I think that if you would like to do this from the scratch, it is quite complex. So I would say like uh, this expression engine is one of the main uh, goals that we have in order to share uh, what an SDK can do for the developers. Okay. And it supports uh, last DHS2 versions. Okay, at the very least, we are ensuring the app compatibility with the DHS2 current and two previous versions. This means three uh, DHS2 versions at total. But you see what is the reality? The reality is like when we uh, published the version 1.0, we were compatible from 2.29 to, to, to 2.33. This is five versions. With 1.1, we were compatible with six versions. And with 1.3, we're going to be compatible from 2.30 to 2.35. So this means that uh, any app that is using the SDK can have like a, let's say, like long life expectations. If you are like, a, you know, you have all these a number of uh, DHS2 version that can run on top. Um, this is basically, I would say, two years and a half of DHS2 uh, server versions. Okay. And what else? So error management. This is also really important. If you are a developer, if you have been like playing and using the API for many times, you see that the number of errors that the, the API can can deliver is huge. So we are like simplifying a lot the, for the for the Android apps the management of the errors. Basically, uh, we we have like a, we are having a granularity at different levels. So in mind that you have a conflict, you have an error, and in the SDK you have you, you are, when you are syncing with the I mean your data, your new TI when you are syncing with the server, you may have some conflicts uh, or errors, and then uh, with SDK is going to uh, have the information about. What is a TI inside of a TI? What is enrollment? What is the event? What is the attribute and data element that is producing that conflict or that error? And also not only this, but also the errors that are like related to the bandwidth, to internet, or the, the connection with the server, timeouts, but gateways, all this is being managed by the by the SDK as well. Uh, integrity check, also very important uh, for when we have like uh, dependencies that, you know, that sometimes there, there are, uh, I mean, we have seen this many times in the past uh, when there are like uh, configurations in the HS2 server side 
that are not properly done, or like I can think, for example, on like program rules with uh, sorry program rules with no program variables, program variables with uh, no data elements or attributes, uh, or even you are trying to synchronize and you are downloading track identity data values, but someone just removed the data element of a particular program stage. So you know these kind of dependencies that normally are like a headache for the developers. We have like a, now a defensive layer against these kind of errors, integrity errors, and we are like in the local database removing all these missing dependencies that we may find. Okay, and I think that the, this was a huge effort as well, and it has been reduced and a lot the number of errors and bugs that we were having in the in the Android application. And uh, online search, so it allows also easily to do a online search. So now it's also possible using like a similar naming convention to, to search the eyes that has been stored in the, in, the, in the local database, but also not all, if you have internet connection, also you can interrogate, you can query the, the TIs that are in the, in the server, when in, the, in, the, in your search or unit tree, okay? Whenever there is an internet connection, again, using kind of the same uh, naming convention from the SDK. Um, receive the unique attributes, also you know that uh, uh, can be auto-generated and, and the SDK also reserves, uh, we have, uh, we are storing also the, the, the unique attributes, so uh, if you are values for unique attributes, so if you are going to be, if you, the user is going to be offline for, I don't know, for one week, so it's going to um, just get the values that has been previously stored in the, in the, in the local database. Okay, so we also have this, uh, this functionality, and also I think that this one is really, really important, database migration. So in the past, uh, with uh, experience with the previous Android applications, sometimes when there was uh, a new Android application, sometimes you have to, uh, the user needs to uninstall, uninstall the new Android application, and then this means that you can maybe, if you have data that's, that hasn't been synchronized with the server yet, so you may uh, lose your data, um, and here with database migration, we, it doesn't matter if you are like upgrading your app from the, uh, the one that is used in the first SDK version, the 1.0, to the newest one. It doesn't matter if you don't have to go version by version. You can go from the, from the very, very, from the very best version to the last version. And the SDK is in, in, in charge of the, doing this in a, in a transparent way. So it will create like the different, it will, yeah, change the, the create a different tables in the database schema that's needed, transform the data in a way that then the, the, the version that you are upgrading to uh, uh, can use. Okay, so it's also like, a, it took us a while, but we are very proud of this feature. Jose, uh, you have two minutes, just so you know. Two minutes only? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, sorry, then, uh, so uh, from, from the latest versions, what we have is SMS synchronization, um, we have also now is uh, uh, Android is, is compatible with the Android 18 app, so uh, you mean this means that with this app you can configure your your, your synchronization uh, mechanism like a frequency of all the apps that are like um, you know like uh, uh, getting data from the server. Uh, so like uh, you want the apps to synchronize every 24 hours, every hour. So you can like define this through our, through Android settings app. And, and then the SDK is consumes this, all this information. It has an encryption. This is really important for, for example, for HIV implementation, when you would like to have the database encrypted. So also from one to we have the, the database, the local database can be encrypted. We have a validation rule engine uh, at the data set level only for data elements uh, that is using the same engine that program indicators and it will show you like how, what are the data elements and the data values that are like violating the, the validation rule and utility classes. So we are like, a, some of the VHS2 logic now is embedded into the SDK, for example, for enrollments and event, and event status. And whenever you have read, write that data access logic uh, to, a, to an object or opening closed, closing date, for example, in, in those units and, and, and category options, all this logic is also embedded into, into the SDK. And if I have just 30 more seconds, Austin, I can say like, a, this is just for Android developers. It's written in Java and Kotlin. Uh, it, this is the database that is being used. And it's a group effort between the SDK developers and the, and the people that are working in the backend in order to, to, uh, to use the most efficient uh, calls. So in a nutshell, if you want to build an app that works offline, that 
you need to be compatible with several entity access to versions because you don't want to build an app that then when there is a new access to version, that app doesn't work anymore. If you need to operate that app, if you, the Android app, if you want to have an automatically upgrade uh, migration control, or if you would like to have the best performance when syncing with the access to server, or if you would like to just build an app uh, on top of, a, of an SDK that simplifies error management return by the API, if you have at least one of these topics when you are building your, your, your app, please use SDK, okay? Because it's going to, it takes time maybe a little bit in order to, to understand what is uh, the, the different functionality of how to use it, but at the end you are going to gain a lot of free time and it's going to make your life much easier in the future. Okay, and sorry if I am keeping some time. No problem, thanks Jose. Thank you, yeah, appreciate it. So uh, with that, I will quickly turn it over to Magnus who will introduce the design lab. Um, and again, if you have more questions or want to hear more about the, the Android SDK, there is a session tomorrow. And I'll, I'll put that on the screen at the end of the session as well. Magnus, are you there? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. And see me, maybe. I will try to share my screen. Let's see. If this is the no, this is the wrong one. Let's see. Sorry for the. It's always a bit hard to find the right Chrome window. Let's <laughs> see. Good luck. Yeah. Yeah. Got it? I think so. Let's see if now you see at least the Google presentation, I hope. Yes. And if I click like this, yes. this is Google screen. Perfect. Nice. Perfect. All right. So uh, I will talk a bit about uh, a little bit of a broader perspective, maybe, on design and innovation. Um, and less kind of technical feature oriented and more about uh, methods and processes and so on. So, uh, but still it's very much related to these uh, app development resources, both for the web and for Android, uh, since this provides a very uh, nice environment and arena to address uh, user specific needs and to design and innovate tools based on user needs. So uh, in this very short introduction, I will just say a little bit about this design lab thing. Uh, and then as Austin mentioned, there is a one hour session tomorrow uh, where I will dive more into uh, some of these issues. So uh, the DHS2 design lab uh, is a project or a group of students and researchers at the University of Oslo. Uh, where we collaborate with uh, DHS2 developers, both in the core team and uh, out there in the community and implementers, uh, where we specifically try to understand how we can strengthen and promote the user-oriented focus in uh, our design and innovation. Uh, so meaning, how can we uh, develop uh, you know, capacity and, um, and uh, focus on uh, catering more for the diverse end user needs that uh, kind of is increasing around the HS2 as it's being taken to new and different contexts. Um, and since this, you know, what is a usable and relevant feature as Austin touched upon typically varies a lot between different implementations. There are you know, different requirements, different needs, different practices. Uh, we are particularly interested in the design processes that uh, are going on on the level of implementation. So when the HS2 is taken into specific organizations, what kind of design processes um, and what kind of user-oriented focus is going on there and what can we learn uh, to from, for example, projects that are uh, doing this in a very good way or and so on and so forth uh, to, to strengthen this focus. So this means that it both, our work kind of both revolves around exploring and developing methods uh, and approaches to design, 
for example, for identifying users' ne user needs, working with users, uh, ideation uh, and prototyping and evaluation of solutions, and so on and so forth. Uh, and of course, apps make, a, as I mentioned, a very critical part of this, since apps provide this flexibility that you need to, to when you identify needs that are beyond the generic capabilities of DHS2. Uh, apps provides this arena where you can uh, develop uh, new and and uh, and custom tools catering for for uh, user needs. Um, and then part of our work is also uh, then all these app resources, specifically for the web, mainly uh, as of now, um, which I think is kind of instrumental in. Uh, making custom app development a, a viable approach to addressing needs. You know, prior to this app development platform, the, it was quite costly both to develop apps and maintain them. Uh, and I think many of these resources that uh, Austin talked about and also for the Android are making app development a much more viable option, uh, which I think is a very interesting development both for, for us as uh, developers and and implementers and also for the it's good news for the end users because then we can really address more of this uh, very different type of end user needs that we see out there in the in the community so uh, this design lab uh, has been going on for about two years and until now we have been collaborating quite uh, strongly with his India in working with them on uh, how yeah, the implementation practices and how users are involved in in uh, design and how we address these issues through apps or customization. This has also then fed back to to develop uh, the development of these web app uh, development resources like the app development platform. We have worked a bit with Mozambique and we're supposed to work much more extensively until Corona came along on on exploring uh, design methods and approaches. Uh, and then we have also visited several other of these HISP groups in Tanzania and Malawi, talking with Uganda and Rwanda to, to look at what practices currently work related to this uh, user focus and what can be strengthened and what are the challenges. Um, in addition, we have a quite big course here at the University of Oslo, where we have over uh, 100 students that actually as a part of the course, develop, uh, design and develop apps for DHS2. And we also use that course as an arena to explore user-oriented innovations, uh, building apps that provides you know, uh, valuable features for different user groups and so on and so forth. Uh, and we also use it as an arena to test these web app development resources. And I will, in my session tomorrow, give some examples of this uh, projects from that course also, just as a, a way of looking at, you know, what, what do we mean by uh, usable and relevant uh, innovations. Yes, so I'll, in the session tomorrow, uh, you will hear more about what, what we do in the design lab and what they have found out during our engagement with, with implementers and developers around, uh, around the world. Uh, and we will try to orient this experiences and and um, and kind of ideas for the future around uh, uh, wh what we mean by user oriented and what we mean by usable and relevant software for example the the difference between uh, digitization and digital innovation so uh, meaning the difference between just providing a kind of copy of an analog system in a digital format versus actually developing things that provide new value to users. Uh, again, app is, a, is, a, is one way of doing that. Uh, and also reflecting a bit on who are we building uh, the software for and who are the tools we're building relevant for. Is it uh, mainly relevant for top level managers or low level users and so on and so forth. And then we will move on to some of the prominent challenges that we, that we have identified uh, with catering for and designing with users during the HS2 implementation. So we will reflect a bit on you know, the, the pros and cons of developing apps uh, and the remaining challenges there. 
uh, issues uh, around uh, suit, finding suitable methods to engage with users and, and, and kind of uh, working in an agile manner to, to, to build the right thing for different user groups. Um, and then another issue that uh, we will discuss is the problem of how projects are structured and the mandates and the scopes of projects, which might in some cases hinder the ability to actually innovate. And in other cases, it might promote innovation. So we'll look a bit at that. And then finally, we will look a bit at the plans we have for the future, uh, amongst other things, to develop a design and innovation toolkit uh, around methods and approaches and capacity building in that manner. Uh, and also some kind of uh, ideas for collaboration and then kind of calls for collaboration with the, with the community. Yes, so that's that's it for me to, for today, and I hope I see you to, tomorrow at one. Great, thanks a lot, Magnus. That was a great session. Um, and again, yeah, there will be another session tomorrow to, for more information about that, and I'll share that in just a moment. So I'm going to share my screen now. Um, let me make sure I have the right thing. Okay, so you should be able to sh see my screen now as well. Thank you again, Magnus, for, for that session. Um, and then I just wanted to echo what Magnus was uh, getting at and what the Design Lab focuses on, which is uh, the enablement of local innovation with this global platform. Um, and I wanted to touch on one more thing before we wrap up for today, uh, which is the inverse of this, actually. So not only do we enable local innovation with our global platform, but we also feed back those local innovations and the learnings from those projects and applications to that global platform to make it uh, a more robust general purpose tool as well as to more uh, effectively serve the needs of local customization and uh, use case uh, customization for DHIS2. Uh, just as an example of that, I mentioned this very, very briefly yesterday in the session on COVID-19 innovations, but I'm going to bring it up again today because I uh, had two minutes yesterday and now I have maybe more like five. Uh, this is a relationship mapping application that was initially developed by His Sri Lanka uh, early on in the, in the COVID-19 response uh, on DHIS2. And basically what this enables you to do is to visualize the relationships between cases and suspects or contacts um, in uh, the outbreak uh, of COVID-19 in this particular case. Um, and what we did with this uh, application is we took the, the initial concept and the initial hackathon developed application and we took the learnings from that in order to develop some general purpose tools that would enable not only this application to be more effective and more useful in other contexts, but also for uh, other applications to be developed using those same common tools. So some of those uh, common tools that came out of this application were uh, the ability to save and load uh, settings and saved objects from the data store, the user data store in, a, in an easy and accessible way from a, a web application. So many web applications use the data store in different ways, but this uh, library that we developed and then are using in this uh, relationship tracing application uh, allows us to, uh, in a standardized way, save things like visualizations to the data store, um, similar to the way that you would save and load an or a visualization in the data visualizer app or in the maps app. Um, this allows you to do the same thing, but with something that isn't doesn't fit the, mo the model of a uh, out of the box visualization or a map. Um, so in this case, we don't have a concept of a relationship map at this point in DHIS2 uh, in the data visualizer application. So this allows you to save and load uh, different configurations of another type of visualization for this uh, custom application. Uh, in, the in the near future, it'll also allow the sharing of those saved objects. Um, and we're now using this, this library that was initially developed, co-developed with uh, His Sri Lanka for uh, I think three other applications now as well. Uh, so this has fed back into the ecosystem uh, and really allowed us to, uh, to make it possible and, and easier to develop these types of applications uh, across the board. 
Another piece that was reused or, or extracted from this project was uh, uh, layout components, general layout components that we uh, initially helped uh, HISP Sri Lanka to develop to have a, a top bar and a sidebar in a, in a standard configuration uh, and now have uh, exposed those in the UI library and those will be coming soon to the, uh, the production version of that UI library uh, and be in use in other applications as well so that uh, it, there, it isn't necessary to reinvent the wheel and create your own top bars and sidebars in your custom applications. Um, additionally, we took some of the learnings from this relationship analytics application, uh, not, the, not the app specifically or the development of the app specifically, but the, the concepts of relationship analytics and how you uh, analyze the, uh, the network of relationships in the DHS2 metadata model. Um, and are applying those learnings as well as the learnings of other, uh, uh, other partners and, and uh, local instances of DHS2 uh, to enable more robust and performant relationship analytics through the API and in the analytics engine of DHS2 itself, as well as to integrate some of those functionalities into the core DHS2 applications such as Tracker uh, ca the capture application and the analytics applications like data visualizer and maps. Um, so those you'll see coming into the DHS2 core in, in one of the next few releases. Um, but this is uh, kind of was inspired by the local uh, adaptation of the DHS2 data model to analyze uh, relationships in a way that hadn't been uh, natively possible before. You can learn more about um, everything that you've heard about in this session. So we talked a little bit about building custom web applications on the app platform, as well as uh, the design lab and building custom applications on the Android SDK. Uh, each of those has its own hour long session. The first one is starting in about 10 minutes um, here on this same channel. So you can stay on, stay on the line if you wanna learn more about uh, the web application platform and how that's used at the University of Oslo to build the core applications, as well as how third party developers can leverage that application platform to build their own local customizations uh, or to share their applications with other DHS2 implementers and users through the App Hub. Um, then uh, tomorrow at uh, one o'clock Central European time, uh, 1300, you, we have a session with Magnus on the DHS2 Design Lab. Uh, the course at the University of Oslo and the participatory design and, and uh, um, uh, yeah, approach to uh, working with local DHS2 implementers to feed back into the, the course, uh, the core development, as well as at uh, 1500, so 3 p.m. Central European time, we have a session on the Android SDK and building custom mobile applications with Jose and some of his colleagues from the uh, Android team as well. Uh, again, I wanted to mention the uh, main resource for developers and uh, people wanting to customize DHIS2 uh, or extend it. Developers at DHIS2.org is where all of that information will live. We're continually updating the resources that live on that uh, developer focused site. So we have announcements of new libraries and new tools that were uh, making available as well as uh, announcement of events like this conference or like the academy that we hosted in uh, June and August of this past summer. Um, we also have uh, developer documentation and guides that we're continually improving and building out there. Uh, and we very much welcome feedback and contributions to that documentation and learning material as well. You can find all of it on GitHub. Uh, and you can also find the community of practice uh, topic for development. And there are two subcategories within that for application development and uh, Android development in the, uh, on the community of practice where you can ask any questions that you might have and we will uh, monitor that pretty frequently. Um, I'm gonna check for questions here now, but then I'll wrap it up because we have about five minutes before the next session. So people will want to go on to their, uh, their other sessions here in just a couple minutes. Um, it looks like we did have a couple, uh, a couple quick questions. Maybe I can uh, pass this one on to 
um, to Magnus if you're there available there. Um, it says, uh, so maybe we can uh, respond to this in on the community of practice because it looks like a little bit more involved question than we have time for today. Um, and I saw that uh, Theo had a number of questions. I answered those on the community of practice as well. So go on to the community of practice link that Simona uh, had shared and you can see the questions and the answers that we will post there as well. Um, with that, I think I'll wrap it up for this session and look forward to seeing some of you in four minutes back on this same Zoom channel uh, for the next session, which will be about the DHS2 web application platform. Thank you all very much for joining us today.